Hi, Dr. Trisha. I'll be turning my camera on shortly. I'm just getting ready. Yeah, sounds good. Wait a minute. Why aren't you wearing a doctor's jacket, Dr. Pastricha? <laughs> Do you want me to? I think I have a white coat somewhere. I mean, if I have one. Keep it on. I mean, I think I think people want it. I think we'll just keep it on just to like, you know, keep people guessing. Like, who's the real doctor here? <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. No, I'm not gonna wear it. No, no, no. I don't want to confuse everybody. Do you want me to go get a white coat? I've got like I've got all kinds of props. I have a stethoscope, a white coat. I can go get it. No, no, no. I believe you. I know you're a real doctor. Hey, thanks for meeting with me. Yeah, I'm delighted. You you picked one of my favorite topics, so I was thrilled to come. I love knowing that this is your favorite topic because you're a gastroenterologist. Yeah, I love, well, I love everything about the gut, but the microbiome is like especially exciting and ultra processed foods are very exciting. So this is great. What is it specifically that excites you about the gut microbiome? I think it's so misunderstood. Um, and yet it is so exciting and the data is really thrilling and it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And there's a lot of emerging research still because there's still a lot that we don't know, right? There's a lot that we don't know. I mean, people have known about the bacteria that live in our bodies for decades and decades, like dating back to the early 1900s and even late 1800s. But in a way, I think the part of it that's new is really understanding the role it plays in our disease and how we might manipulate it towards health. That part is still newer and still emerging. Let's set the scene here. What exactly is the gut microbiome? Where is it? What's going on there? The gut microbiome, that is what people have estimated to be around the order of about 100 trillion different microbes that live in our guts. Um, and our guts are not unique in our bodies in that, in that they have their microbiome. Our skin has a microbiome. Um, our, you know, our mouths have a microbiome. Um, but our gut microbiome seems to really play an important role in our health and in disease. Um, and we're still kind of trying to figure out what those connections are. Okay, so these are microbes. These are microbes. How many are we talking here? Every estimate is a little bit different, but I think the order that most people would agree on is fair is about a hundred trillion different microbes. Wow, that's a lot. So we've we've essentially we've been colonized by these guys. <laughs> we've been colonized happily and willingly so. Yeah, because we we need them. We need them. We need them. We rely on them. They do a lot of great things for us. Now there can also be some harms associated with them, but um, but for the most part, you know, they they help us in in a lot of different ways. They participate, of course, in in the most basic of of needs, which is digestion. Um, but they also they do a lot of different other things for our health. They produce these metabolites you may have heard of, like short chain fatty acids, um, and these things can have really important impacts on the rest of our body and uh, in in terms of different uh, diseases. I think when people think the gut, they just think of like their abs. In my case, super, super taut abs. Same. <laughs> so, so toit. No, I was, just, <laughs> but the gut is actually, there's a lot more. Like where, where exactly is the gut microbiome? Well, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. You know, the gut, I think, is an all-encompassing term. We're, we're usually talking about the colon, although bacteria live in the small intestine as well. And we're usually not talking about the stomach, though, specifically. Very few bacteria can survive in the acidic environment of the stomach. The stomach is the beginning of digestion, you know, okay. and that's where the food starts to become broken down into tiny particles that then pass into the small intestine. Okay. And so by the time food has reached the colon, you know, and it has transitioned to what we might call poop, you've really derived all of the nutrients that you want out of it because the small intestine's job, which is in between the stomach and the large intestine or the colon, is to really absorb all of the nutrients and all of the good aspects of whatever you've eaten into the bloodstream and where it could be processed and used by the rest of your body. So it's really the waste that makes it to your large colon. But if you think about it, um, you know, waste is, means like your body, the rest of your body or other organs don't have a need for it. But what could make it there is fiber. Fiber is not digested. It's not broken down. It's not absorbed by the body, but it's a wonderful thing. And your gut microbes really love it and thrive off of it. And then when they take that fiber in, you know, they produce these beneficial metabolites, one of which could be short chain fatty acids or, or other things. Okay. I've heard of short chain fatty acids. I don't know what that is though. So when we think about the microbiome, I think it's helpful to think about it maybe in three different parts, right? So there's these things called prebiotics, um, then there's maybe probiotics, and then there's these like postbiotics. So all of us, all of us Americans, we're not getting enough fiber in our diet. Like, so just take, accept that. Whatever way you can ex bring, you know, more, increase the amount of fiber in your diet, you'll be better off. 
But if you really want to take it to the next level, what you want is the diversity in your diet. This is not you know, reflective of anyone individually, this is like 96% of Americans don't meet the dietary recommended amount of fiber. So if that- What's you, wrong with us? Well, it's not even, I don't, it's not a personal fault. Like we have these systems in place that uh, part of it is sort of our ultra processed food industry that that really keep us from reaching those goals. And yeah, it's, I mean, hard. there is a lot of food that comes in boxes. There's a lot of, and that's I, sort of like, that's like, I remember reading, like that's one of those things that's like, if it comes in a box, it's been processed. Yeah. How do you tell the difference between ultra processed, minimally processed, you know, hardly processed at all or whole foods? And I think a lot of us know, you know, like we know a whole food when we see it, we pick it up in the produce aisle, but then there's all this, this huge gray zone in between, like the boxed prepackaged foods, that's probably heavily been, been heavily processed. But I think the more, you know, I think a simple way to think about it is if you look at the ingredient list and you you could create this in your own kitchen. Like, yeah, it would be a lot more work, but I could make this pasta sauce with all the ingredients I have in my pantry. Then that's probably minimally processed. But if there's a bunch of chemicals in that pasta sauce, like, like, or you would have to go to some kind of industrialized kitchen to produce the shapes, like that are the shapes of a lot of breakfast cereals. You can't make that. Like you can't get some corn, mash it up and then produce those shapes like in your own kitchen. And if you can talk right. to me, like, let me know. I want to come over. But um, <laughs> but you need some sort of like major, that, then that's a sign that this has been even more processed. And, um, right. and so that's one way to think about it. So all of these things contribute to the bacteria themselves and what kind of the composition, what strains and species these different bacteria are. If we're just talking about ingesting foods that we know contain beneficial bacteria, so that would be like fermented foods, kimchi, sauerkraut, active cultures like in Greek yogurt, Wonderful. Nobody's ever going to say that that's a bad idea. Um, and, and those things are known to improve the kind of overall composition of the microbiome, and they're associated with decreased rates of gut symptoms. But then we talk about postbiotics sometimes. That's the other you know, fancy word for what is, the, what is it that the bacteria are producing? What comes after that? Or after that? And one of those things are short-chain fatty acids. Um, short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, you may have heard of, um, are, are these beneficial molecules that have a, an important role in our bodies. They can kind of help dampen inflammation. They're associated with uh, reduced risk of all kinds of diseases, including cardiovascular diseases. And the kinds of postbiotics that your microbiome produces, they're different person to person, and they, and they ultimately can be traced back oftentimes to what you're feeding that microbiome in the first place. So the more fiber you eat, and we're talking veggies, whole grains, and the microbes are just like, nom, 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 nom. I'm so happy. They love it. It's a buffet yeah. for them. And, and the fiber, you know, just because it's not absorbed, doesn't mean it's not benefiting you sort of personally earlier on in the process, right? Because fiber, it takes longer to digest. So some of the benefits you feel even before it hits the colon is that you might feel fuller longer. Like you'll feel like you've had a more satisfied meal as opposed to what we might talk about later, these ultra processed foods that have this quick release of sugar. They're very easily broken down by the stomach. And then you're hungry again 15 minutes later. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There's a lot of mileage in there, pun intended. <laughs> there is. It's long. It's windy. The amount of time it takes for your food to become poop, to, to exit the body is different from the, from me. It's different from the other people who might be watching this. Everyone takes a little bit of a, a different length of time, but but it can be on the order of days. And so it takes a long time to get absorbed first by the small intestine, all the nutrients, but then, you know, we have a little bit more control in when we poop. And so if we, for whatever reason, have decided like we can't afford to poop for the next five hours, we're in this middle of this podcast, we've got to focus. Um, you could, you could, you could control that. You could hold it in. And that entire time, whatever you're, you've not, you've decided to not excrete, your microbiome continues to feed off of it sits there and your microbiome is loving it. Um, and it's, eating that fiber or whatever else you've given it to, to chew on and producing more and more short chain fatty acids. It's a really nice visual. It's like, it's yeah. like a nice, like block party. Yeah. And like right before lunch, it's perfect. It's great. <laughs> so what do people get wrong about the microbiome? Yeah. A couple of different things, you know, um, one of which is that, you know, I think that we, it's very easy for us to oversimplify the microbiome by saying there's good bacteria and bad bacteria. There's, mm. there, there's just bacteria and bacteria just exist. Right. And yeah. so like one of the most famous bacteria in our microbiome, um, and that people talk about sometimes when they get infected by it is Clostridium difficile or C difficile. Um, it's, it, 
when it becomes an infection, it can cause horrible diarrhea. People can get hospitalized. In the worst case, it could be fatal. You might need to get your colon removed in, in extreme cases. But actually, lots of us are just living with C. difficile day to day. And it actually takes a certain sort of set of environmental factors before it becomes what we might call a disease. But it's just living yeah. with us. And I think the problem with a lot of, not the problem, but sort of the foundation of a lot of microbiome research and, and what makes the next 10 years very exciting, because we're about to build on that, is, is simply that we've identified so many different diseases, ranging from irritable bowel syndrome, which is very common, affects like 15% of Americans, to Parkinson's disease. These states are all associated with different microbial signatures. And then it becomes a little bit slippery. You might say, well you know, like Parkinson's disease, for example, this type of bacteria is seen in higher abundance or, or lesser abundance. Therefore, this is a good or bad bacteria. And, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, it we don't know that. We don't know if the bacterial changes we're seeing are a cause or an effect of the disease in a lot of cases. Mm. And so I think we just want to be careful to not say like, you know, something is good or bad in the microbiome. And, you know, remember with ultra processed foods, like unfortunately our worlds are are conspiring against us. You walk into the grocery store, you're not hit with like tons of wonderful whole foods often. They're there. They're often there depending on your grocery store, but that's right. not the stuff that's marketed to you every single day. And it's not the right. stuff that's been, that's often easier to quick and easy to cook. We're all, you know, our time is very valuable. Um, and it, it may or may not be cheaper. I mean, that's a huge consideration. Right. That's so true. It's funny. I'm thinking of like my supermarket and as soon as I walk in, it's the, in the entryway, the vestibule, it's, um, is that the right term? It's <laughs> snacks, you know, yeah. snacks, 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 soda. Then I go and then the doors open and it's, the produce is straight ahead, but immediately to my left, it's like, there's like a little like, hey, donuts and cakes and cupcakes. Yes, welcome. And it's kind of like, ah, hi, Christina. <laughs> and I'm like, no, don't look at me. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, yeah, you, but nope, eyes on the prize. Keep going straight. Yeah, to the extent possible. And then you get to the checkout line and it's like all the candy bars <laughs> and like everything else that you're like, oh, yeah, this would hit really nice right now. And it, it's like by design that they don't put apples at the checkout line. Like they put the candy bars and the like kind of processed granola bars there. Right. When we're talking about emulsifiers, are there any sort of household names for emulsifiers that we that come to mind or are they just is it just emulsifiers? I'm trying to think of like sort of like the ingredients list on like a box of cereal, for example. You see guar gum, xanthan gum. Um, you see those everywhere, sorbitan, monosterate, right. and they're not the first ingredients that you'll see. Like they're like in that like last little bit that's like, you know, like in a list of like 50 other chemicals. So ultra processed food consumption is linked to inflammatory bowel disease. It's linked to colorectal cancer. It's linked to irritable bowel syndrome. Your colon um, is this organ in your body that is aligned with these epithelial cells. And normally these epithelial cells are the lining cells of your colon. They should be really tightly up against each other without mm -hmm. a lot of room for something to slip past in them. Because everything okay. you eat, you don't want that to just like immediately enter your bloodstream. You want there to be a barrier. So not only do you have really, really tight junctions between your epithelial or your lining cells, but you have this layer of mucus on top of those cells. That mucus mm. barrier is very important. It keeps the bacteria, the microbiome, which lives right on top of the mucus layer from sitting there and attacking your actual lining cells all day. It sits on a mucus layer that's thick, it's protective for you, and it actually feeds them. And there's actually a lot of interaction between the mucus layer and the bacteria that's beneficial. So that's a happy world right there. Yeah, right. Emulsifiers in ultra processed foods break down that mucus barrier that you have. When you break down that mucus barrier between your gut bacteria and your actual gut, actually the lining cells, you have bacteria that are in direct contact suddenly with you. You don't always like that. In fact, that can trigger inflammation in those cells. And those junctions that I talked about that are used to be so tightly opposed one next to another, they start to open up because they're inflamed, they're angry. And actually what that does is cause bacteria to enter the colon, enter your bloodstream. Um, and that's been shown to be the case with, with emulsifiers. And emulsifiers, um, nanoparticles, artificial sweeteners as well, they also decrease the bacterial diversity in the gut microbiome, meaning the number, the kinds of bacteria, those all go down the more you have these different kinds of additives that make their way into ultra processed foods. And that's not good for your health. It does sound like though, that there is, that the gut microbiome is dynamic. There is a way to certainly make changes to improve the health, 
have the have those microbes flourish, uh, thrive, party, get along really well together. And so it's not like, you know, it's, it's, you can change it, right? It, it's never too late to change your microbiome. Diet is the most important thing that we can do. Now, now changing your diet is not going to change it overnight. This is going to be a slow change. Um, and one that you have to stick with and be consistent with in order to continue to feed and continue to foster. When I counsel patients about like, how do we eat fewer ultra processed foods? It's one it's really hard to make a big change. Like I, I almost never tell patients, I couldn't do this myself to say, all right, starting tomorrow, let's cut out all ultra processed foods from your life. Um, and, and like, see how you live for two weeks. Like I usually tell someone like pick one meal. Okay. Rather than like, let's go cold whole foods for, you know, 30 days, which would be wonderful. If you can do that, do it. But otherwise pick one meal, that you usually eat, like breakfast, I often start with because our breakfasts are usually, I find a lot of my patients, myself included, we eat the same thing every day. We diversify our lunches and dinners sometimes, but breakfast tends to be the same, like sort of quick thing. Right. Um, and, and so start with breakfast and say like, what is one substitute I might do that's healthier? And maybe it's going to be just as simple as like, I'm going to fry my eggs in olive oil instead of canola oil, a like, great place to start. Okay. Um, or maybe instead of having you know, an ultra processed sausage with my breakfast, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to have some beans that morning. Uh, you know, it's like a classic English breakfast. I'm going to just substitute mm -hmm. it with something else. Um, and just see how that one tiny substitution goes. And if you can stick with a tiny substitution, but it's something you do every day and you're going to do that for the next, you know, 40, 50 years of your life, give or take, like, you've made a huge impact on your health by doing one small thing rather than trying to make a hundred big changes in two weeks of which you're going to give all up like as soon as it's over because it's all unsustainable. Right. So like baby steps, go easy. Don't be so hard on yourself because then you're sort of setting yourself up for failure if you're going a little too hard, too fast. And what we're putting into our bodies um, is going to affect each of us in an individual way. We don't yet have the tools to predict what my particular microbiome's exact needs are and then how to do that exact replacement. I do think even 10 years is a bit of a stretch, but I do think like probably in the next 20, 30 years, we're going to have that. And it's going to be more widespread and individualized and precise. We're just not there today. Okay. So wise. Hey, are you taking new patients? Yeah, send me a referral. We'll see. It might be a little weird. Might be a little weird. <laughs> um, thank you so much. This was so much fun. You're, you're a delight. Thank you. And, um, yeah, I'm probably going to ask you more questions again. Send me all of the questions that you don't want showing up on your Google search history about your gut. Let me I appreciate know. that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Christina. Take care.